Good afternoon. Lovely to see you all. And then those who have returned from this morning, thank you for staying with us. Um, a big welcome also to those coming online who have yet to join us for HistFest. We have two fantastic speakers today, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this one. It's going to take us through a fantastic journey. But before I go, we delve into that, uh, just a quick reminder for those online uh, that we have questions at the end, always question box available for you to type in, and we'll get to those at the end. Microphones available to those in person. Um, we have BSL captioning in the audience here as well as online. And we have links to books available to those online. Have a look at that. And books for our two guests are also available outside later on to purchase for those here. So, our two guests today. We have Islam Issa, who's an award-winning British Egyptian writer, curator, and broadcaster. And he was recently named by the BBC as one of the UK's most significant new thinkers. He's a professor of literature and history at Birmingham City University and has authored several academic books and contributes regularly to a few newspapers, including The Guardian, The New Statesman and The Times Literary Supplement. And then we have Michael Woods, historian, filmmaker and broadcaster. I'm sure many of you will have seen his films, among them In the Footsteps of Alexander the Great, the Great and the Story of India, uh, which the Wall Street Journal described as still the gold standard of documentary history making. His story in England, which told the tale of one village, Kibworth in Leicestershire, through British history, was called by the Independent the most innovative history series ever on TV. Uh, Michael has a new book out. Uh, it's on China's greatest poet in the footsteps of Du Fu. So, without further ado, can you please give a very warm round of applause? Thanks very much. You, you were talking about a great journey, and I, it, um, I, I, when I've looked at the book, I come from a cold northern industrial town. And uh, when I was a teenager, which now I have to admit is more than half a century ago, it's terrifying to think, isn't it? And I first took to the road hitchhiking, as we did in those days. And I found my way down to Greece and to the waterfront in Piraeus, the old waterfront of Piraeus, um, where the, the old shipping offices advertised boats to Crete and Cyprus and Rhodes. And there, on the old Poseidon Express window, was ferries to Alexandria. And I remember the heart-pumping, just the fantastic excitement as a teenager, that it was possible to get a ferry to Alexandria, the real place in history, but also the place of the imagination, as Constantine Cavafy put it, the capital of memories. And we're going to take that ferry over the Wyandotte Sea now in the company of Islam, who teaches, as you've heard, in Birmingham City University, um, but whose family come from Alexandria. And that, to me, adds a a wonderful flavour to this, this book, um, which is a hugely entertaining, kind of panoramic, can I call it, love letter? <laughs> um, to, to Alexandria, coming 2,300 years of history from Alexander the Great to you know, Napoleon and Muhammad Ali Pasha, the creator of the modern city, and Gamal Abdel Nasser, who, as we will hear, happens to have been the son of Islam's grandfather's postman. So, first question then. It's grand sweep history, as you can tell, but at times it's also a very personal memoir. The air is full of the sounds and the smells of the streets of Alexandria, and your granddad is a kind of one of the little heroes in the story, perhaps. So tell us first of all about your family, Islam. You talk in the book about 100 generations of Alexandrians 
since the founding. Where, where do you fit in in that? Thank you for, for being here and thank you for such a generous introduction. I mean, I fit in proudly as the hundredth generation of, of, of people who can call themselves by that demonym, Alexandrian. Um, you know, I, I'll go to, to the acknowledgements. I acknowledge somebody I call Ancestor the Great, not Alexander the Great, <laughs> Ancestor the Great. I don't know who Ancestor the Great is. I hoped as part of this journey to find Ancestor the Great. Um, and I think in some parts of the world, you know, either the National Archives are harder to get to, um, the um, family histories are not quite recorded with the same rigor because a lot of it was oral tradition. And so, you know, I've, I've managed to find things a few generations back, but beyond that, I don't know. And one of the things I thought I'd do, which, which again, I'm, you know, um, I'm not claiming uh, scientific knowledge of how, it, you know, the, the, the ramifications of it, was, was to ask my parents to do ancestry tests. And um, just, you know, the, 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 regular, the regular online purchased ones. It's the scholarly rigor is, 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 is quite a bit better in the book than, 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 this, than this anecdote. Um, but, you know, my dad's returned 97.5% next to Egypt. And then when we clicked Egypt, it said Alexandria. And that, that was shocking because, first of all, I didn't know that the, the test was that detailed in terms of the, the location. But second of all, because I have no idea what that actually means. Mm -hmm. In the sense that, does it mean that my ancestors were there before Alexander the Great? <laughs> <laughs> Which is partly what I want to believe. Or does it just mean that we, we really are you know, a part of that city? And being a part of a, of a space you know, is, is more than ancestry tests. It's, it's, uh, it's in the core. And so Alexandria for me is a, is, is a little root uh, that sprouts wherever I am, um, including in sunny Birmingham. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that the family history is, is essentially that, you know, I was raised in, in the UK, uh, but um, still having been raised in the UK, we, we went to Alexandria every, every summer. Um, so, so I maintained that, that link. And, and largely through my parents' um, um, nostalgia, let's say, of, of really um, passing on stories, and uh, instilling this kind of love for that city. Um, and, and I think purposely so, my granddad um, con is constantly lurking in the background of this, of this book and of this narrative, because that's where uh, I feel I come into it, but also because I wanted the heroes of this story, and they're vast, aren't they? From, from before Alexander, you know, from Aristotle who taught Alexander, uh, to, to all the way to, to the present day, um, men and women, uh, famous names. You've mentioned a few. You know, there's also Cleopatra, there's a seventh, the seventh, so there's many, there's six Cleopatras before her. There's, there's Cleopatra, there's, um, you know, Napoleon and Admiral Nelson who, who fight over the city. Um, but, yeah, I wanted some heroes in the city who are the, the everyday people, and so my... Uh, great granddad was was a, a, a labourer, um, and it was great to find out um, more about him um, through uh, going to um, relatives that I ordinarily wouldn't, wouldn't wouldn't have gone to. You know, going to go, going going to Alexandria, um, you know, as as a, as, a, as a teenager and so on. I just wanted to go to the beach, um, but you know, when I came to write this book, I actually went and met you know great uncles and great aunties and stuff and. Uh, and, and that was part of the great research process. You know, the research process, I did go to the archives, uh, spent long amounts of, uh, long, long periods of time in there, but the, the real research was, was that sort of flanner w walking and talking to people in, in the cafes and alleyways and talking to, to family. Um, so I found out, you know, my great granddad was, was, was in Alexandria. He, he worked in sort of farming and, 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 and there was a lot of construction happening at the time. Uh, and then he, um, he, he, he managed to um, start a, a, an apple, uh, like to import apples, because they didn't, don't grow in Egypt, they were in Turkey. So he started importing apples and became, and started selling apples in, in Alexandria, which is a really, really nice um, little, little detail I had no idea about. 
Um, my, my granddad worked in a cotton factory, um, but then he, he, he bought a, a rations shop, it was called, so he'd sell you know, uh, tea, and uh, tea, tea's an important ration, isn't it? You know, and sugar and uh, rice and so on. Uh, so great. I, yeah. I love the idea that your, your ancestors might have been there even before Alexander. Um, I suddenly, I suddenly had this vision that uh, the Greeks came in laying out their grand palaces and their new boulevards and everything else. The family property was appropriated and, and your ancestors have hung around all this time just to get it back. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Alexander the Great. Uh, the book begins, well, it begins before Alexander, but the, the, the inciting incident, if I can put it this way in kind of Hollywood terms, is the founding of the city. And Alexander has begun his great invasion of Asia. And that winter, he's had a terrible siege in Gaza, of all places. And he comes to Egypt that winter of 332 to 1, isn't it? Mm -hmm. BC. Yeah. Tell us BC. Yeah. So how does, at this point, when he's engaged in such a huge and epoch-making campaign. He takes time off to lay out this city. Can you tell us the story? What actually happened? Did he physically lay it out? What? Well, the story of Alexandria is one where we have to kind of accept the relationship between mythology and, and history. And, um, you know, a nice percentage <laughs> of, of everything we say about Alexandria, you have to take with a pinch of mythological salt, you know, that, that there's going to be some, some myth to it. Um, what, what, what do we know? Well, I think there's, there's an element of psychology related to Alexander's character that he wants world domination, right? I, I, don't, I don't think there's, there's another way of putting it. It's world domination, and, and, and Egypt is both a place that's already famous so when he arrives in 331 BC in Egypt, that's halfway between us and the Great Pyramids of Giza. That's how long Egypt had been, uh, had, 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 had stood in its majesty. Um, and so it's a place that's already got a reputation for knowledge, for power, for grain, which is extremely important for his army. Um, and it's ruled by the Persians at this point. Point is it still? It is ruled by the yeah. Persians, but the, the, the they, there's there's a couple of revolts by the Egyptians against the Persians. So the Persians kind of take um, uh, a certain outlook on the Egyptians that they're um, that, that, that is less respectful, let's say, um, and and Alexander makes use of that because when he arrives in Egypt, he decides to um, appreciate the Egyptian gods and the Egyptian culture, and in some ways the timing was perfect because though he was essentially invading Egypt, the Egyptians welcomed him to a larger extent than they welcomed others because he was ridding them of the Persians. Um, so there's that aspect of Egypt being a great place already. And the other aspect is the geographical location, really. It's at the intersection of three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a way that he, his troops can, can move rather quickly into, into Asia. Uh, you've got the Red Sea. Uh, connecting uh, Egypt and, and, and Asia, um, and, and Alexandria, of course, is, is, is perfectly positioned for that. So it's at the intersection of continents, isn't it? So, so in founding the city, is he really looking as so far ahead that he, he's already planning that it will be a world city? What's going on in his mind? Well, the, the, the legend is that he arrives because of um, finding out about it from, from, from Homer. So, so we have to take a step back, even before Alexander. Homer, uh, at this time, isn't just uh, poetry or literature. It's, it's, it's history. It's seen as factual. There's an absence of religious scripture, so it's really important. And in the Odyssey, we have this description of the Pharos Island, where Alexandria will be founded, you know, um, on the shore of Egypt, where loud the billows roar. Pharos, they call it, on the Egyptian shore. Mm. Uh, and he, he, he gets up after he sees supposedly a dream uh, in which a venerable man comes to him and narrates those lines. And so he decides to go to Pharos. So he's got the advantage that it's already in the Greek consciousness. 
Theros is the little island where he's going to find found Alexandria. So when he arrives, actually, I think there's something of an anticlimax. He's, he's, he's found a barren island, and he's found a series of fishing villages, not too ambitious. But what he does find is something he perhaps wasn't expecting, which is a huge lake, Mariotis, a lake to the south. So th this location has the Mediterranean to the north and this lake to the south. And water is essentially life-giving. Uh, if you look at Alexander's other cities, they're constantly around um, rivers, lakes, and oceans. Um, and and, and in, in fact, there's a story about um, Denocrates, the, the, uh, the architect who, who, found, uh, who, who was given the task of designing Alexandria, that he came to Alexander at one stage and offered to make him a kind of Mount Rushmore style um, um, uh, city in the mountains. And, and Alexander allegedly refused because it wasn't going to work in terms of water. There wouldn't be enough water for this, for this kind of city in the mountains. So, so he's concerned with, with water. He finds this lake and uh, this Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and then he connects, using a sort of causeway, he connects this little island with the coast um, to, 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 to found the city. At this time, it's Alexandria by Egypt. So by it's Egypt. By Egypt. It's yeah. not so not in, in Egypt. Egypt. Yeah, yeah, it's not in Egypt. Yeah. It's seen as something still perhaps kind of Hellenistic. It's close enough to the, to the, to the Hellenistic world. Um, and so he... he Legend has it, when he arrives, he's so ecstatic about this location that he gets down onto his knees and begins to scribble a map or design of the city into the sand. And he includes in it the markets and the squares, but he also includes in it a shrine to the muses, the library. Um, and uh, and so, so the vision of Alexander, for me, is, is um, followed. Alexander's very excitable. So, so he, he founds it and runs off to his next adventure um, to, to see where, where he wants to find out if he's divine, and, as you do. And so <laughs> at this time, um, Ptolemy, uh, you know, uh, he, he leaves the city to, in, in an architect's hands, Democrates, but it's his friend uh, and general, Ptolemy, who will really create the city after Alexander's uh, passing. Um, now, Ptolemy and Alexander, to put some added to more context, are tutored by Aristotle. So they're tutored by Aristotle. And Aristotle is tutored by Plato. And Plato is tutored by Socrates. Now, that's a great, great line of teaching. Scholarly yeah. pedigree like no other, isn't it, really? <laughs> so, so it makes sense for there to be some sort of uh, knowledge-based vision to this, to this city. And I think there are two radical ideas here. The first from Alexander is that you create a city at the intersection of the continents and you invite people from far and wide to live in it in order to create an economic hub. And to a large extent that worked. And, and actually they, they began to force people from other parts of Egypt to go to Alexandria because they founded a city and then they realized there was no one there. Right? And, and so and they, they, they opened the invitation, for example, to an important group, the Jews, who, who move westwards to Alexandria are promised freedom of worship, their own Jewish quarter, and no taxation. So um, they, they, they go there. Some people from the Levant, from, uh, from Nubia, from even, even evidence of, of some Indians going in the early uh, years. So that's the first radical vision. The second one I'd summarize as knowledge equals power. The idea that if you can gather the world's knowledge, to some extent write it and disseminate it, then you have serious soft power. And I think those were the two visions that were enacted by Alexander and the early rulers of the city. I suppose, you know, you look at Aristotle's influence and it's, it's an internationalizing concept of Greek civilization, isn't it, in a way? I mean, when you look at the Greeks and their kind of the landscape of Greece, when you think about the impact that the Greeks have had on the world, you know, compared to India and China, it's such a tiny place. It's a land of many islands and promontories and archipelagos, and, and, and the mainland is so mountainous. It, perhaps it was inevitable always that the Greeks would go overseas, you know, the golden Greeks. 
But here, they are, they're consciously creating an international city for an international age. I, I think so, and I think it's very early on in the vision. And, and uh, to a large extent, Alexander would have been expected to really Hellenize uh, the city or, or the new place, you know, to bring Greek culture to it. But instead, I think he harmonizes. He, he brings a bit of Hellenistic culture and mixes it with the Egyptian culture, the Jewish culture that's arrived, uh, and all the other bits and bobs that arrive. Uh, to the extent that, that it becomes a kind of international, international city trading hub, knowledge hub. Um, that's, that's very conscious. Ptolemy I, so straight after Alexander, he introduces a god, Serapis, who's a purposeful amalgamation of the Egyptian gods and the Greek gods. That, that says it all, because Alexandria then has its own divine protector, its own god. And as the library, for example, progresses, it stops thinking about Egyptian knowledge and Greek knowledge and begins to think of something new, Alexandrian knowledge. Yeah, great. Now, you've mentioned the library. Um, we should just try and imagine the new city as it grew in those first couple of centuries. Um, tell us about the library, first of all. It's an incredible idea, isn't it? Um, a universal library. It's kind of straight out of Borges, isn't it? Or one of the modern writers on fictional libraries. Uh, Borges himself talks about, you know, the, the uh, dangers of absolute knowledge, <laughs> of trying to get absolute knowledge. And, and um, what, what happens in Alexandria is, is, like I said, this attempt for soft power. But Ptolemy, uh, according to the letter of Aristeas, which is the earliest mention um, of, of, of the library in the um, late 3rd century BC, um, m mentions that, that there was, he, he brought in somebody to to take care of the library, he gave him much money. And why? To gather all the books in the world. That's the quote. That's the job description, <laughs> right? To gather all the books in the world. So, so the ambition of this project, the, the, idealist, the idealist or idealistic ambition of this project is, is immense. Because gathering all the books in the world is a seemingly impossible task, but it's also not a hugely selective task. So it presents all sorts of problems and becomes something of an obsession. So the library is, is, uh, is built in the royal quarter um, and it's um, a state endeavor on which m much money has been spent um, and on which many policies and laws will depend as well. Um, and uh, it's, it's, gonna, it's going to be, um, you know, we don't, we don't have any, any um, you know, really clear descriptions, but we can assume it was wonderfully colonnaded brilliant pillars and statues and busts um, and, uh, and that the, the, the books would have been, uh, you know, in, in ceiling high shelves, uh, the, the scrolls, you know, like, like logs of wood. Um, so so it's, it's, a, it's a lovely image. But what also happens is adjacent to it, we have something called the, the museum. So, so the library's biblios, the library's, you know, the, shri the shrine of books. The museum's the shrine of muses, but they're in the same complex. And the museum is where the research will take place, where the translation will take place, um, and, and where scholars could come from anywhere around the world and uh, live uh, rent-free with food and a stipend, um, which didn't always go down well for the, for the local population. Um, so what one, one of the skeptical poets of the period wrote, it, wrote that they were um, birds stuck in the cage of muses um, rather than the shrine of muses, that they were um, upholding the policy of the, the rulers and, um, and, and uh, arguing among themselves without really, you know, the kind of ivory tower image we, we, we have today. And like all obsessional collectors, they weren't above stealing or subterfuge to get the uh, text that they wanted. Yes, I mean, there's all sorts of issues. Um, you know, uh, books, when, when so much money is being spent on books uh, and, and when it's state policy, that does present problems. So, so I, mean, I mean, some of the policies, for example, if any ship docked into Alexandria's harbour, it had to be searched, not for contraband, but for books. Right? If a book was found, it was immediately confiscated. When it was confiscated, it was taken to the library where it would be copied. But the copy's going back to the owner. <laughs> um, and uh, you, know, th th you weren't allowed to take an original scroll out of the city, so you'd be searched on your way out. 
Um, the, the, the scholars weren't allowed to take books out of the complex. Um, the, um, you know, the, 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 there is some, some kind of obsessive law you know, um, and, and a willingness to spend money. So they borrow the great text of the Greek tragedians mm. from Athens and they put a deposit, which in today's terms would be about £300,000. And they do that knowing full well they don't care about the deposit because they want to keep these original mm -hmm. Greek tragedies. Um, and so it became um, you know, a matter of foreign policy because the ruler would have to wonder whether harming the relationship with that other city was worth the book that they were stealing from them. Um, and, and then you have other, other laws that affected, for example, Pergamon, where there was a rival library, was, was the embargo of papyrus uh, export, so that the other library couldn't catch up. Um, and, that, and the other library then begins to use parchment. So we get the uh, animal um, uh, skin. So we get the word parchment from, from Pergamon. Mm. So all sorts of laws. Mm. It's, it's tantalizing, isn't it? The, the lost library. Um, you know, we've got seven plays by Sophocles out of 120 that survive, and they had them all. Mm. What, do we know what happened to the library? Fire. <laughs> Fire. <laughs> um, Probably um, a steady decline. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we have we have some some indications. So we know that in the around sort of 44 BC, Julius Caesar's army purposely sets fire to to the city in in uh, you know um, alongside Cleopatra. In, in, interestingly, um, and the, the, you know Plutarch writes that it destroyed the life. And that's probably not the case. Um, that there was that they had so many books, they were overflowing, that they had stock rooms around the harbour. So, in his own autobiography, Caesar, who always refers to himself as Caesar did this, Caesar did that, it's, it's quite unsettling. But he 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 writes that they uh, they set they set fire to the ships, and um, it goes into the city. It probably set fire to some of the stock around the harbour. Um, and, and there were lots of sister libraries because it was overstocking. So, you know, the, the Serapeum, which was the, the main temple, uh, you know, I went, I went into, the, into the bottom, into, into an underground part of it, a, a very nice um, uh, security uh, person with a, with a very big weapon went down, down with me. I've never been alone with someone underground with, with, such a, with a machine gun, but anyway. Um, <laughs> to show me, he pointed with the machine gun at the little shelves, <laughs> that would have been little shelves yeah. for, the, for the overstock libraries um, in, the, in the ancient temples. Yeah. So, so you do have um, the potential for, for, for that, for, for, for some of the sister temples being, being, sorry, sister libraries being destroyed with that, by that fire. But then we also have um, Antony and Cleopatra. We're told that Antony gifts books to Cleopatra for the library for their wedding or, or, or when, 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 they, when they get together. So you wonder whether the library still existed. Um, and then we have in the uh, third century CE, uh, Car Caracalla, who goes and, and uh, he thought that um, the Arist so Aristotle um, and, and Alexander fell, fell out, essentially, <coughs> um, even though Aristotle was spying for Alexander and all sorts of things. So, so they fell out, and as a result of them falling out, uh, rumours began that Aristotle's, uh, Aristotle was responsible for Alexander's death. So Caracalla believed that, and he loved Alexander. And so he uh, destroyed the Aristotelian texts when he went to Alexandria. Mm -hmm. And then we have Aurelian, another uh, Roman ruler, who uh, s destroyed the royal quarter. And we know the library was in the royal quarter. And then in uh, the early, uh, around 400, the early 400s, um, Orosius, a, a Roman historian, writes that the shelves are empty. Writes again, suggesting that the library was was perhaps still there. So I, I'd say it was a steady, steady, a steady decline. decline. Yeah. And, and in many ways, it's yeah. kind of um, it tells you something about the the nature of the rule of the time. You know, n n don't want to go into today's politics per se, but you know, the the funding that libraries receive says something about the government of the time. So the royal tutor uh, was a librarian. The head librarian was, was, had a kind of ministerial role. 
he had to live in the palace, in the royal palace. Uh, and he had to tutor the princes and the princesses. And he, they, they were celebrities. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a fragment, papyrus fragment found in 1914 that shows a school exercise um, from uh, you know, 2,000 years ago where the, where the students had to name the librarians one by one. So they were celebrities. Um, and they had to offer counsel to the, to the uh, ruler as well. Um, you know, the early librarians, one of them said to Ptolemy I, you know, you need to read books because they will tell you, what they, they will tell you things without being scared of you. <laughs> so, so, so they gave him counsel as well. So by the time we get to some of the later Ptolemies, the royal, uh, sorry, the, 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 the chief librarian is an army commander. Right? So, so you see the shift uh, in, 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 in the role of the library and the importance of the library through, the, through who is placed as chief librarian as well. I suppose, I mean, it is a fabulously universalist vision of culture, isn't it? And it and, um, comes in a fabulously universalist age. I mean, you, you call the book, the subtitle, The City That Changed the World. And, uh, of course, lots of people write books saying this changed that, or this changed that, or this... And, but actually, in your case, it, it really did change the world in the, in the, the Hellenistic age, um, spreading Hellenistic culture all the way to India and even China, possibly. You know. um, before we leave that age, though, uh, just give us a picture of the physical image of the city, because within a couple of centuries, you've got writers like Diodorus of Sicily saying this is the, this is the greatest city in the civilized world mm. uh, it has everything it has luxury learning freedom all these things um, what was it like to visit the city and of course it, it was the home to one of the seven wonders of the world mm. um, the pharos the great the great lighthouse i sometimes think that you know migrants and immigrants to new york city in the early part of the skyscraper age arriving in Manhattan must have had something like the same buzz that mm -hmm. people did when they arrived in Alexandria. Give us a, give us a picture of the Pharos. Well, I, I, I call, the, call it the Alexandrian dream, you know, talking of the, the American dream. I think there's a period where people know that they can live a better life there, uh, that they can uh, follow their own beliefs there, there's job opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it's a symbol of power. This lighthouse, the, the tallest uh, man-made, human-made building in the world after the um, pyramids, essentially, um, would have been like nothing anyone has seen before in its, in its height. Uh, you know, well over 100 uh, meters, and it's um, uh, three-tiered, and uh, with white limestone that reflected in the sun, um, mirrors at the top for reflecting the sun as well, and a furnace during the night. Uh, and right on the entrance, the harbors are either side of it on the spot where Alexander founded the city and where the cit citadel is today. And it's really another example of, of, of soft power and, uh, and, and, and telling people that this is a different age. I think people who arrived in Alexandria in that period in, the, in its early centuries would have thought that they had been transported into the future. The shiny roads, many, um, many um, uh, reports of, of perfumed roads, right? And uh, Alexander was, uh, and Ptolemy, uh, you know, they'd gone to Persia where they, they'd found the, um, the perfumeries, the perfume factories uh, as well. So uh, something really grand uh, with, with roads where uh, the chariots, there were three lanes of chariots, you know, like a highway. Uh, on, the, on either side, uh, angled, the promenade angled in order to welcome the sea breeze, uh, which, which you still feel today if, if, if you go. So really something extraordinary, uh, like, like stepping into the future. But also the, the inventions that happened in the museum would have, been, would have been noticeable. So you have these festivals, the Alexandrians love the festival, and you have these kind of big uh, machines that that, that squirt out wine for everyone, and you have uh, vending machines, really, you know, um, that, that give you holy water, 
you know, stuff that was uh, dancing dolls, you know, um, stuff that was unimaginable to people. Yes, I love that. I love that little detail of, of the coin-operated vending machines for holy water. I mean, <laughs> so um, and along with that, and I wish we could talk the whole time of this about the Hellenistic age because it is so extraordinary in the history of the world, um, one of the greatest of periods in the history of the world. But it also the combination of the wealth, the libraries and freedom and the multicultural nature of it led to extraordinary series of uh, explorations in philosophy and religion and uh, intellectual life too. Sure. And in many ways, it's because Alexandria wasn't a democracy <laughs> in the way that, that Athens was. So in, a dem in, 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 uh, in Athens' demo democracy, it, you, know, you could be evicted from the city as a scholar on grounds of impiety, which basically means you say anything that the majority of scholars don't like. And they vote you out of the city with, with oyster shells, right? On well, oyster shells. Mm -hmm. um, no such um, democracy in Alexandria, really ruled by a monarchy in the, the, the Ptolemies, the dynasty, mm -hmm. uh, who are encouraging uh, different perspectives. Um, and so you, you have people leaving Athens, especially, and going to Alexandria because their views are, are rather unwelcome uh, elsewhere. For example, uh, heliocentrism, you know, the idea that the that the Earth goes around the Sun um, was was something that was first, you know, discussed in all seriousness in in Alexandria. Um, but then you 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 have an extension of of, of um, Aristotle's beliefs or Plato's beliefs, like Neoplatonism, um, because again in Greece I think there would have been some unease about challenging the views of the the great philosophers, um, and then something. Uh, 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 you know, by no means perfect, but some some different gender empowerment in Alexandria as well. So the Alexandria Medical School allowed women, and the Greek Medical School didn't. It was only for men. Wow. So so that's an example of where um, th there was you know women landowners um, and and so on. And so the kinds of things they found were inevitably different in that in that school. You know the the, the the, um, the, the techniques they used um, in, during, uh, you know, for, for breast cancer in Alexandria are practically the same as, as they are today. Um, the, um, you know, the, the, the movement, the shift away from thinking of the heart as the center of the human. You know, Aristotle believed the heart was the center of the human you know, function and the brain's function was to manage its temperature. Um, but in, you know, in, 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 in Alexandria, the brain became something uh, important. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Egyptians before Alexandria also didn't perceive the brain to be important. You know, in mummification, they'd drill a hole in the nose and stick a seven inch hook in there and bring all the brains out right, um, as part of the mummification process. Alexandria makes that shift um, from uh, heart to, to, to brain. So loads of different um, potentials as a result of the mix of people there and the, the relative freedom. And, and I suppose, uh, you know, we haven't mentioned it, but the wealth of the, wealth of the city, um, there's also a lot of evidence for the spread of Alexandrian merchants across the whole of the known world almost, isn't there? And mm. Going as far as Central Asia and um, an Alexandrian merchant's manual listing all the ports down the Red Sea to India and all that. Um, uh, for two or three centuries, an immense amount of money is also generated by the merchants of the city. Is it? Yeah, I mean, uh, probably the busiest harbour in the world it's, uh, you know, in, in, in its early years. Um, and also um, the, the existence of you know, what we today term multimillionaires. Mm -hmm. Uh, the people who, who really understood how to do the import and export business, mm -hmm. um, the people who understood land ownership. And we begin to see the, the, the wealthy merchants of Alexandria owning land around the region, owning land in, in the Greek uh, uh, islands, owning land in, in other parts, parts of Egypt as well. But yeah, the, the evidence, um, we, still, we still find evidence. Recently they've found you know, little caskets of um, Alexandrian wine in, in uh, parts of uh, France. Um, you know, that dates over 2,000 years. 
So, uh, yeah, um, the import of export potential, largely because it's at the intersection of Asia and Europe, is, is huge. And things change. When does the big change come then? Is it with the Arab conquests? <laughs> do, do, does the city last until the four and five hundreds in still as a, as a great multicultural city until the Arab conquest? What, what do you think, Islamis? I think it's, again, similar to the library decline. There, there, the, the Alexandria is a fluctuating city, but the, there, is, there is some decline under the Romans. The Romans arrive, and uh, you know, it's suddenly one of a few cities they care about, whereas the Ptolemies only really cared about Alexandria and put all their resources into Alexandria, made it the center of their government, the center of their plans and economy. The Romans come in and, and suddenly that changes a bit. The rise of Christianity similarly uh, you know, creates a shift, a geographical shift in, 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 in the regions that people uh, care about and the regions that money is being put into. Mm. Um, Egypt is, uh, or, or, you know, ha has its own uh, Egyptian culture, ancient Egyptian culture, that, that, that is, is still quite vibrant into the Roman period, but that the Christians see as paganism. Uh, they see the Greek and Egyptian traditions as paganism. And so Alexandria, again, becomes a kind of place where it's a bit difficult to manage. And so uh, with the rise of Christianity, Alexandria declines a bit again. Right. And then more so with, with, the, with the Arab um, annexation because the Arabs are essentially land lovers. And so they are the first, when, when, the, when the Muslims arrive in Alexandria, that is the first time since, it's, um, since the Ptolemaic period where it's no longer a capital because they can't have a capital that's A, that diverse because that's, that's something they're not, they're not sure how to deal with. It's got so many different types of people in it. And B, the, the caliph uh, Omar is said to have, have told, told, um, told his, his, his general there, we can't have water between... Um, you know, the Arabian Peninsula and our capital in Egypt. And so they moved the capital to what is, what is now old Cairo. Oh, no. um, and also they hadn't developed their naval strength, the Arabs. Um, so all of those things do cause a, a serious decline in Alexandria. So it's another big shift in the, the history of the world, in a sense, that, uh, that what had been a huge open system that's connecting the Mediterranean and the Near East and Europe... Um, the Arab conquests leave Alexandria slightly high and dry with continuing wars with Arabs and Byzantium and everything. It's, it becomes um, more isolated. It doesn't, and it's, it's, it's not out of disrespect for Alexandria. I think it's out of awe and fear of how different Alexandria is. Mm -hmm. um, they, they see somewhere that's, uh, that's, that's completely different to, to what they've seen before. They, they uh, you know... The, uh, they're very much um, a sort of tent-based um, landscape at the time. Yeah, yeah. Alexandria has what to them would have been a kind of Manhattan-like feel. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the priorities shift as they, as they begin to spread the Islamic faith um, eastwards. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the eventually Baghdad takes more importance um, and... Uh, not to mention Mecca and Medina as well. Yeah. And, and Baghdad almost succeeding Alexandria as a world city, isn't it? With some of the same ideas, don't you think? The great library, the great the bookshops, the, the, they almost ta are taking on board. The, because, you know, it's one of the most distinctive things, isn't it, about early Islamic culture is how strongly they value the Hellenistic the Greek legacy, translating it all into, yeah. into Arabic and so on. We, I, I'm sorry, I've talked for so long about, or let you talk for so long about the um, Hellenistic age, but it's just, I'm sure you all agree, it is so, so fantastically interesting. But um, before we go, just a, um, a word or two about the Ottomans and the modern age. Um, by 1800, the city was an... Had, was a ruined field with only a population of about 6,000 people, wasn't it? But the city had another of those um, moments of rebirth in the 19th century, didn't it? And became a great, partly European city in the age of imperialism. Do you want to say a brief word about that? Yeah. I mean, um, 
one of the people credited for that, or you know, rightly, is, is Muhammad Ali uh, Persha, who, who's you know of, of um, uh, Albanian, Macedonian origin, and 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 comes to to Alexandria, uh, and and creates a, a vision, a new vision, uh, and and uh, that new vision is 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 similar in a way to Alexander the, the Great's initial vision, which is bringing people from far and wide into the city. One of the key ways of doing that, for example, is opening uh, the cotton exchange uh, and benefiting from cotton and making Egyptian cotton what, what we know of it today as this you know, prestigious cotton that made lots of money for the city, and inviting people from different parts of Europe especially, to the extent that we get to a stage where about half of the city is of European origin. And that's one of the fascinating things, you know, for certainly for my parents and grandparents growing up in Egypt, is that for them, sorry, in Alexandria particularly, for them, the idea of being Alexandrian was not limited to being Arab in the way that it is today. Uh, they had neighbors from Italy and Greece and Malta uh, and Armenia um, and France, um, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was terribly struck by this. I picked off my shelf an old um, uh, guide to Egypt, and and out of it fell um, one of my uncle Sid's little souvenirs that he brought back from Alexandria in the Second World War. And I mention this because it's this is from Spiros Grivas's shop in in the Boulevard Sad Saglou. Uh, in Alexandria, and it's a ca simple calendar that you carry around. And what's so remarkable about, about it, in 1942, is it has the list of the Prophet's birthday and the Muslim New Year and all that sort of stuff. It has the Muslim calendar, it has the Christian feasts, and it has all the Jewish feasts, the Fast of Esther, the Purim, Pentecost, and so on. I mean, it's still, in 1942, it was that multicultural... Ideal, but that was virtually the end, wasn't it? I mean, it went in the 50s and 60s under your, your granddad's postman's son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two, two things. Predominantly, you know, the, 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 the Balfour Declaration, you know, the founding of, 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 uh, of the Zionist state is, is one of the key moments in Alexandria's history. Interestingly, I found evidence that, you know, when the Balfour Declaration was, was made, the Muslims went to their Jewish neighbors to congratulate them, you know, and, uh, and the, the, the governor of Alexandria sent, you know, congratulations to, to the Jewish community for the Balfour Declaration. So I don't think the ramifications were clear at that time, but it also it meant that, uh, that some Jews left the city. But then the, the, the big one really was, was um, the rise of, of Nasser um, in, you know, 52, uh, where they, they um, uh, revolted against the monarchy and uh, the monarchy was the extension, you know, King Farouk was the extension of the Muhammad Ali dynasty. Um, but, you know, they, they, they'd, they'd made lots of errors and they'd been spending money lavishly and so on. Um, and with the rise of, of, of that, there was a rise of Arab nationalism. Um, Arab nationalism really did cause many of the Europeans to flee. Um, so uh, not only the wars, the Egyptian wars with Israel with the, with the, with the, with the um, mm. sort of nail, nail in the coffin for the Jewish community who left to France and so on and to, and to Israel, but also you know, many of the Greeks and French and Armenian and so on did end up leaving the city. It's um, so tragic, is isn't it? Very you different know, you, to, to the yeah. city my dad, my dad yeah, talks about. Yeah. When, you, when you think about what used to be called the Levant with sort of uh, um, Smyrna, Izmir, Beirut, Aleppo, Alexandria, the, the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean was a kind of uh, transcended nationalism and borders and faiths and everything else, didn't it, up to the modern era. But nationalism has cut a sway through that tragically. You do have some, some uh, signs of, 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 a, of a nice period in, 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 in Alexandria. You know, you have one of the you know, almost the, the, the poet of the city is, an, is not an Arab, you know, it's Kavafi, um, who, who's, who's of, of Greek origin, and, and he's regarded by Egyptians. You know, people talk about Forster and, and, uh, and Durant and so on, but, you know, they, they lived during a time when 
of war. They didn't really mix with the mm. Egyptians. They didn't speak the language. Kavafi, on the other hand, really embodies Alexandria. Mm. That's an example. The prophet Daniel Street, you know, once you go past oh, the yeah. Apple Store and the Papa John's, you know, you have mm. uh, wh where Alexander the Great might be underneath Papa John's. Um, <laughs> you, you, you end up with, um, you know, a synagogue, a mosque, and a, and a church right next to each yeah. other. Yeah, although sadly, there are only, I think, 12 Jewish people left in Alexandria now, not even a quorum for the s services in the synagogue. It's well, the, the, official, the official number, but the, yeah. the Egyptian government spent millions of dollars renovating, renovating the, the synagogue. The synagogue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and um, you know, the, 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 there's, there's a feeling in, in, in Egypt that those places are still important. Right. There is that feeling. I think we've got to, got to call time on now to, to throw it open to questions. Well, I'm sure you've all got a lot. Um, but just a final word. The book ends with your journey back to your granddad's house with this, where the portrait hangs, wearing his fez, which Nasser, didn't Nasser ban the fez? I can't, I can't did, remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and I found myself thinking, as you describe your final, your, your journey, uh, final journey in the book, um, back, that uh, there, there was a saying that no one, no one ever leaves Alexandria. Mm. Is that... Is that you too? Is that... It is, yes. I mean, but without, without any spoilers, um, <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, it's it's like I said, it's 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 something that stays with me everywhere, and and in a way, it's being being Alexandrians, being a part of the, the history of the world, not just of the, the the history of a city. That's great. Well, it's a it's a feast. So, big thanks to Islamisa. <laughs>
that's just not, uh, we don't know the answer to. So I'd be wary about saying that a swap has happened. This is a really huge case of you know, mistaken identity. Um, but you know, both of those figures are so important to Alexandria that, uh, that, that the quest for them continues. Long may continue. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, lady here. Um, obviously, we're talking about the library gathering scrolls from everywhere, including the Greek ones. Was it an attempt to gather other forms of records, like cuneiform tablets or other forms of information from the past, or was it all just very much the modern equivalent scroll book? Mm. Like, or were they trying to find other ways of recording data as well? All right, yeah. So it's a lovely question. Thank you. On, on the whole, I've not seen any evidence of, of them caring much about anything but scrolls. Um, to the extent that actually, um, you know, forgery became very common as well. You know, if they're gathering every book in the world, uh, then anybody who writes anything half decent can earn some money, right? Um, Give you an eyewitness account of the Trojan War if you want one. There you go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, really many people um, said they listened to someone. So, like, what this philosopher left unsaid, and they claimed that they listened to him. As a, as, a, as a side note, you know, but no, I mean, it really was a concern with, with, with scrolls. Um, but it would be really interesting to check what, what further items they had. Interesting they question about cuneiform, well. actually, isn't it? Because I think cuneiform, I think the last practitioners of cuneiform were probably around the first century AD. Mm. Um, but by then, hardly anybody knew how to do it. And the libraries, presumably, most of them had been you know, ruined long ago, yeah. and, and perhaps, uh, perhaps, because a Greek, a Greek Berossus did actually try to produce a, a history of Babylonia, didn't he? Mm. But I think it was a, another of your wonderful inventions, <laughs> rather than actually actually based on real text. Yeah, but and I mean, bit building on from that, we we have stories of um, uh, the Egyptian priests, for example, being asked to write down their histories, suggesting that they actually moved it from one form to another. And with the translation of the Hebrew Bible, legend has it they arrived with tablets, but they turned them into scroll form. So it does seem like, like that yes, would have been yeah, yeah. The, the emphasis. Yeah. Another question? Lady there. Um, hi, thank you both uh, gentlemen. That was a fascinating conversation. Um, my question is about the, I'm going to, diplomatically call it the acquisitions process of the library uh, of Alexandria, where you mentioned that the originals are kept and the copies are sent back out into the world. And I just wondered if you had maybe come across anything that might make you suspect there was some sort of censorship or judicious editing in that copying process that went on, because there was this dragon-like hoarding of knowledge that I can't help but feel something might have happened there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, to be honest, not so much in the materials themselves, but more in the idea, uh, the ideas of the skeptics of the period. The skeptics of the period who said that this was um, establishing and, and re-establishing Ptolemaic rule. And so, uh, for example, um, emphasizing some texts over others. Homer takes you know, this prime position, um, Aristotle and his students take prime position, but those who are against Aristotle's school maybe not, uh, maybe not, not gathered as much, uh, maybe not translated as much because there was translation. Um, so you had you know, a whole team of copyists and translators uh, and so on. So that, that's the kind of evidence that suggests that there was still a hierarchy of texts. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's evidence of censoring at text level, but uh, a sort of a wider selection process. Mm. Huge effort of Alexandrian scholarship on literature, of course. You know, home, the great tradition of Homeric mm. scholarship in Alexandria, where, you know, they, they, um, they got hold of every variant text that they could possibly get hold of to try to establish Homer's true text. Mm. Although you can see in the scholarly apparatus of modern editions that the Alexandrian scholars would sometimes excise lines mm. or... Uh, or, or adopt a reading that made more sense to them because 
the original reading didn't seem to make sense in terms of the, the landscape or something else, you know. Mm. Mycenaean words, even, even Bronze Age words, fall out of the, of the scholarship because their, their meanings were forgotten. So there was a, there's a long engagement with the, na the nature of the text, which is fascinating Especially in itself. on the literary side, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, on the yeah. literary And the more that yeah. uh, they start to write epigrams and, and yeah. shorten things as well. So there's, there's, a, there's a period in, in Alexandria where they think epics are far too long. Yeah. <laughs> um, isn't untrue. But, um, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, Homer, you do repeat yourself. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other could, thoughts? Could we do one from home, from the viewers at home? Pardon? Could we do one from yeah, the viewers yeah. at home? Yeah. Um, this is a question from Bandit Queen. Um, she asks, what do you think went wrong in Alexandria causing a breakdown between various sects and ideas which led to riots in the 4th century AD? <sighs> That's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bandit Queen. Bandit. Yeah. yeah, Bandit Queen. Um, I mean, you, you have a, a rise or in political religious, religiosity at, at one stage. So, uh, you know, uh, with, with um, uh, the, the monks, for example, are being used by, uh, you know, the monks were, were an oddly violent bunch in, in the fourth century. Um, they live in the mountains, and then when, when the, the chief priest has an issue, they come down and they, they start to um, you know, use, you, you, uh, abuse people and so on. So you have that, that aspect, um, and then you have the, the governor. The governor is being perceived as non-religious. So, so a lot of it is, is, is to do with the rise of religiosity, um, where the governors are accused of not not appreciating the religious aspects of, of, of people. But a different concept um, of religion as well, do you think? I mean, what strikes you about the, the you know, classical Greek period and, uh, is that these are, not, these are not religions where there is an, an idea of the truth, mm. if you like. And once you have the idea that there is a truth which has come down from God and... and and it's the scholarly class and the, the priestly class who will interpret it. Then, and if you deviate from it, you're a heretic or you're whatever. You, in all religions, it's the same, isn't it? You, you then start to have splits and sects that disagree over the fundamentals of interpretation. Yeah. That wasn't the way that ancient Greek religion worked. No, nor, nor Judaism. Judaism was very much built on, on debate. And, and Christianity took from that, and in its early years, Christianity was built on, on some aspects of debate in Alexandria. And I think by the time you get to the fourth, the fourth century, um, because it's been politicized, because the bishop is then, the, 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 the pope, if you like, of, of Alexandria now has a political weight, mm. um, it, it serves him in his best interest to have one idea of the truth. And, and a lot of what happens in Alexandria is, is based on that religion uh, the, the issues with religion, you know, when one group see, looks down on another as pagan and when uh, one group thinks the other is replacing its, its long-standing traditions, um, you know, th those, are the, those are the issues. And it's at that point, of course, that you get um, movements against particular books where they should be destroyed, they shouldn't be reproduced in, you know, copied. Um, you get heretics like Arius who were... Who were um, you know, we, we won't have that. The, the Orthodox Church won't have that. Mm. Yeah. Which happens in, other, in the Muslim period as well, doesn't it? I was recently talking to a friend about um, a, what, an amazing story from Cairo, if I can di digress, just because these long um, uh, memories in Egyptian culture are so interesting, aren't they? The great uh, scholar Louis Massignon, who's, who um, uh, was doing his doctoral viva in Cairo in about 1908 or whenever. Mm. And, and his thesis was about the great Muslim mystic Al-Halaj who was executed in 922. And, and, and he, when he was executed, Halaj, who was a poet and a mystic, his works were banned. You were not allowed to reproduce them, recite them, copy them, or anything on pain of death. This was the, so, so severe was his heresy. And in this viva, Massignon tells the story that uh, one of the scholars in Cairo said, but there are still living chains of testimony of the poetry of Halaj, of families here in Cairo, 
and also in Baghdad and elsewhere, who have transmitted the knowledge of the poetry over a thousand years, even though you weren't allowed to do that on, on, on the pain of death. Mm. So, um, yeah, there's, there are, the censorship of texts carries on in a, once you're into these world religions. Yeah, and, and, and in a way, you know, Alexandria changes the world, not just through, uh, you know, the, the positive scholarship we're talking about, but also through that kind of heresy and, mm -hmm. and so on. I mean, the Nicene Creed mm -hmm. is, is a result of the Aryan view that comes from Alexandria. They have to shut it off, so they create that, that creed. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, there's, there's, um, there's a lot to be said about the negative moments in Alexandria's mm -hmm. history and their influence as well. Any other thoughts? Yes, more yeah, gentlemen there. Uh, so I was just wondering that, so between the Ottomans, uh, Pasha uh, and the British, how did Alexandria's position within their respective governments and empires, how did that change over those periods? <laughs> yeah, un under the Ottomans, for, for, for large periods, it turns into a sort of deserted space uh, the population um, really does dwindle. Um, and then under the um, Muhammad Ali Pasha, it's, it begins to, to gain that, that momentum again, uh, in large part, like I said, due to things like the cotton, the cotton trade. With the British um, and the French sort of simultaneously, uh, they see the potential in terms of location, um, because at this stage we don't have you know, the sewers uh, canals. So, so Alexandria remains that key link between Africa uh, and Europe and, and then Asia. Um, and uh, and, and when, when, when they realize the, the, the potential, I guess it's a colonial potential for the riches of India and China and so on, Alexandria regains its importance uh, as, as a result of that. Um, in terms of, of, of how the city fed you know, in and of itself, um, it does become a bit more polarized in the sense that you start to have really um, safe, prosperous areas, and then you begin to have these kind of more deserted, uh, less prosperous areas, um, especially given the, 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 the rise of industry. Again, many Egyptians come in to, um, many of the other Egyptians, the southern, southern Egyptians start to come to, to Alexandria as well, and that brings about some change in terms of culture as well and population. Lady over there. Two ladies over there. Thank you. Um, so my question is partly informed by Egyptian cereals, which I admit I dabble in. Um, so what does Alexandria represent in the popular imagination in Egypt today? Would you say it's more of an aspiration or an ideal or just a nostalgic idea that of something that's past, long past? Yeah. I'd say it differs depending on whether you have Alexandrian heritage or not. Um, I'd say for, for many Egyptians, Alexandria is, a, is, the, is, the, is the summer holiday. Um, but it's also you know, somewhere that's, uh, that's inevitably got, got a long history. Uh, they recognize that long history. Um, for Alexandrians, I think, I think there's, there's a lot to do with sort of founding myths. Um, with Alexander, the figure of Alexander himself. Um, you know, like I said, um, we have these theories about where he's buried. You know, in one of the cafes I went to, there's a, there's a picture of Alexander blowing a big bubble gum. Um, you know, there's a statue of him in the roundabouts. You know, so, so that, that figure remains important. And then the other side of that, or another side of that, would be the ancestry side. So everybody's got a story to set to tell, like, you know, my grandparents came from Armenia and my neighbor's parents were originally Jewish. And, and that kind of uh, idea of sort of heritage is, is important in the, in the Alexandrian consciousness. But, you know, Alexandrians today would call Cairo Egypt. You know, and uh, that there's a kind of differentiation. There remains differentiation. I'll, I'll forgive you for mentioning Cairo, but um, <laughs> you know, th there is a kind of differentiation between between the two as well. Yeah, it's funny that with Egyptians, isn't it? 
I've even found in Luxor people saying, yeah, yeah we're, when we go to Misa, and, the, yeah. and that, means that, that means going to Cairo, that, and that's the word for Egypt, but mm. Cairo is a different, yeah. yeah. Do you want to pass the, the, the yeah, okay. Cool. Um, I'm really interested in the, um, in the concept of being 100 generations of Alexandrians. You know, for British people, I think we struggle to think of three generations, and only if your grandparents happened to be alive when you were born. How does that affect the way that people talk about history in Alexandria? Does it have a more personal element than it does here? Or, you know, and w what are some of the ways that people feel responsible for passing it on? Yeah. In, in, in a way, uh, many people, you know, not being idealistic anymore, many people are sort of oblivious to, to the, the fact that they might be the 100th generation. Um, there's, uh, you know, the, there's the link with Alexander that I can't, can't overemphasize. You know, I remember, I remember being in, uh, getting a call from my uncle, who said, uh, "Are you coming for dinner?" You know, when I was there once, I was walking to the balcony, and I said, "No, no, I'm meeting a, a sculptor who's, who says he's late about to found the tomb of Alexander. You know, he's following any lead." And he said, "Oh." My uncle said, oh, Alexander, he's in our hearts because we were in his hearts. <laughs> and, and, I th and, and, and that was a really you know, obscure remark from, from my uncle. But you know, that's, that's a kind of um, uh, way that people think about their, their intergenerational, the generational link to, to the founding story. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of perceiving history, I think the history of Alexandria architecturally, for example, is sort of conspicuously absent. Um, so there's a lot of kind of erasure when one, uh, the easiest thing is with religion, right? The, the, the Egyptian temples, the, 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 the religious sites are often on the, the best spots, high hills, lots of space. The Egyptian temples turn into a church and the church is turned into a mosque and so on. You know, but there's a mosque in Alexandria that people still call the Mosque of St. Athanasius, right? Um, you know, just to, that's, how, that's how strange the city can be. So that's the kind of um, erasure that can happen. It's not just with that. You know, the Mamluks might replace something that the Abbasids had, who replaced something the Fatimids had, and so on. Um, and then you have the fact that the city's partially under the water. You know, it's said that we've only found about 2% of the ancient Alexandrian artifacts that are under the water, and much of the city's under the ground. There's a city on top of a city. Um, and so, you know, to, to see ancient Alexandrian artifacts, you're probably better off going, you know, architecture, you're probably better off going to Rome, <laughs> oh, you know. Um, so, so there's an element of that kind of erasure or uh, replacement as well that, that affects the physical manifestation of that history. And then a very urban population, you know, six million people who, in a very busy space, uh, who, uh, do they benefit from these reminiscences of the past being around them? I don't know. I think they just kind of want to get to work and back and so on. So you, you also have, have that kind of tension with history and, 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 and preservation of history. Thank you. Um, this might be a slightly unfair question for a history festival, but I wonder what you thought the future of Alexandria might look like. There's, if you look at demographics and birth rates, many of the cities of the next century that are important in the world may well be in Africa. Do you think there's a world that you can imagine Alexandria changing the world again? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is very much a question of history, isn't it? Because history tells us, tells us about, about the future in many ways uh, or can help us understand the present and the future. Um, Alexandria in the future, there's, there's, a, there's an element of... Um, there's a conversation that needs to be had about rising sea levels. Um, you know, they are rising. Uh, it was Boris Johnson actually mentioned it alongside, you know, Miami in, 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 his, uh, in one of his latest COP speeches that, you know, if the sea levels rise, we might lose Alexandria. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, they're, they're not rising at a level that is yet dangerous, and there are lots of uh, protections, natural protections there, but that's a conversation that, that's important. Um, in terms of the, 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 the living off its past, you know, there are conversations <laughs> about rebuilding the lighthouse, for example. Now, that would be used, you know, almost certainly to political ends. 
So, so how do we control this renovation of Alexandria, reinvigoration? Uh, the new library was built um, around 20 years ago, and in an attempt to do something similar to the previous one, um, had a, had, has a system that records every single web page ever. You know? So there's, there's, you know, do we need to, to do something similar to what was done before, or is there something new to be done with the city? Right now, Alexandria's population is increasing. Um, people from around Egypt are moving to it, and actually from other parts of the Arab region now with, with issues in Sudan and, 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 and Syria and so on. Um, so the population's rising. The space is, the space is sort of building uh, westwards and southwards. So the city is expanding. But then also, um, it's building upwards. Uh, and so you know, all those things about the sea breeze, uh, and, uh, and, and the views of the sea are not, are not going to last that long if, if it keeps building upwards on the promenade. So that there are lots of issues and, and concerns with Alexandria. Um, but I think it, it, it has a kind of timelessness uh, and uh, a feel, let's say a feel, that it's uh, sort of going to be eternally of some importance. We chose a good spot. <laughs> That's the key. Yep. <laughs> All good. Are you? Yeah. Are you happy? <laughs> Thanks a lot. You've yeah, been. Sure. Yeah, we've got to wrap up, but um, um, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, as you can tell, uh, the book is an absolutely. It's a wonderful cornucopia of stories of extraordinary people. Um, all of which have this common thread of this extraordinary city. And I do agree that the, uh, from my limited acquaintance with Alexandria, it's, it's impossible to walk around it without feeling the presence of all those ghosts, you know. Um, but it's a living and vibrant city, and who knows what will happen in the next phase of its, of its life. But a big thanks... Islam, really great to see you and, um, and thanks for all your insight today. Thank you.